I'd rather create something that others criticize than create nothing and criticize others. If you have high quality products behind the bar, it's like weapon. It's not about the figures. It's about who those figures are. The Hospopreneurs Podcast. I'm going to drink this beer. Yeah, let's crack it. With James Henderson. Hello and welcome to episode 40 of the Hospopreneurs Podcast. This is the first episode with two guests, Alex Lawton and Tyler Hood. They're building a coffee community called The Monday, educating and inspiring the public on specialty coffee, where passionate drinkers unite to learn about the Devil's Cup. From community building and brand management to optimizing the human experience, we get into a lot today. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hello and welcome to the show, Alex and Tyler. How are you going? Hey. Doing very well, doing very well. Obviously, we've got a little bit of a different episode today. So uh, we are going to have an interesting interview where I'll try to direct questions to to each of you. But as you know, the first question that I like to ask is if you have a crazy hospitality story. Well, this one was we were both together. So it's probably perfect. We had a last minute wedding that we'd kind of forgot about and it was uh, on Christmas Eve. So we drove nine hours, nine hours down Armadale. and what? Yeah. Yep. And so we had like nowhere to stay when we were down there because all the places were booked out. We were kind of just like, oh, to the bride, can we like crash at your mom's place? Oh, they were fine. They were lovely. They, they let us <laughs> yeah, stay. They were like, yeah, sure. <laughs> were like, awesome. So yeah, I went back and stayed there on Christmas, uh, or Christmas Eve night. Yeah, so after the wedding, we went back and stayed there, and then we woke up on Christmas morning to find all the relatives over for Christmas breakfast. So we're in someone else's family. Just Christmas, yeah. you know, morning crashing. Sitting at the breakfast <laughs> table, and the lady we're sitting across from starts talking about coffee and how she likes the education side of it and everything like that. Both our ears pricked up, like, oh, what, what is this she's talking about? And she's like, yeah, been really enjoying learning about this and our education center for this coffee. And turns out she um, works at an academy where they teach people how to brew all different styles of coffee. We sort of brought it up with her really casually, like, oh, that's really cool. What's that about? We run a specialty coffee community in Brisbane. And... She was delighted, and then the rest of the morning we just couldn't stop talking about it. So funny to meet people over the breakfast table on Christmas morning in someone else's home. Yeah, you never know who's someone else's relatives, uh, <laughs> where you'll end up on Christmas Day, and who you'll end up chatting to. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you were there for the wedding, so Makes I mean, sense. the family is kind of yeah. expected. But that, that's good. Uh, that's that's a really interesting story. Thank you for for sharing that. That's and fine. we are going to delve a bit further into the specialty coffee community that you guys are building uh, and a bit about your background. But before we get into that, the next question I'd like to ask is why you do what you do. And if you guys have different answers, I'd love to know. Uh, myself, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a graphic designer, um, but I think over the years of doing a lot of different design as well as uh, a lot of marketing stuff and you know also video work, photography, events, all that side of thing, I've really shifted uh, myself into, I guess, just experience design. Uh, So for me, I really enjoy creating experiences, whether that is through video, photography, music, you know, design, whatever it is, to, you know, give people really good, you know, experience um, and a really good, unique time, you know, around whatever it is that they're um, interacting with, whether it's a product or an event, or I sort of enjoy being a designer for those reasons to to bring those experiences to life. What is it about that that really inspires you? So on a deeper level, so that's a little bit about the technical aspect of it. What is it about that that really, that you're really passionate about, that really drives that? Well, I think at the end of the day, I'm just searching for really good experiences. So when I come across a good experience, you know, at a cafe or an event or something, that just, it really sticks with me. It gets in my head and I start thinking, a lot about how I can recreate that or bring it to more people. Mm. Yeah, cool. So you uh, in this search for awesome experiences, the way I think about it is that in the end, all we have are memories. And if we create good experiences, then we have better memories. That's it. Um, that's how I think about it. Yeah, fantastic. So I hope that that 
Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah that's it's just different words to describe the same thing, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, through the I think I've found my medium that I can do that effectively through design and, and whatnot. Yeah, awesome, Alex. So my why of why I do everything that I do and strive to push myself is so that I can help people connect the dots in their lives. So a lot of the time I come across people who've you know got really good ideas or you know they're working on a really good project but there's just some things missing where I can see the opportunity but it's just connecting them to those opportunities and that can propel them a lot further. Well I like that connecting the dots and then propelling them what is it about that or how, how do you go about doing these things guys how do you actually execute on your whys? Yeah, so I started more so in the marketing end of design and working a lot as consulting and helping businesses grow. Seeing all the potential in terms of marketing has opened my eyes to see what other things are out there and to help people not just in a business sense, but in a personal sense as well. And then design really helps with that. So um, using designed to persuade people or to educate people it's really important and so that's why i love doing design for that mm-hmm. yeah and, Tyler, and obviously how are you guys doing that together mm-hmm. um yeah well how i'm you know doing the things that i enjoy doing bringing those to life i've really been uh enjoying seeing how it can be brought to life through uh, events and stuff like that over the last few years, we've been holding a lot of events around uh, designers and makers, fashion designers, entrepreneurs, that sort of thing, and uh, bringing together a community around that as well uh, has been a really great tool and also like just way to, to learn together. Yeah, on that, learning together, there's a lot of opportunities that have just found within the community, and whereas we don't need to step in anymore and help people connect the dots, they kind of do it for themselves, which is really great just by putting a few people in the room together that will get along and be able to help each other and complement each other. Yeah, making it bigger than ourselves as well. Yes. So, in bringing people together that also want to learn about similar things, we can um, you know put many heads together and all learn together and get a better bigger perspective than just us yes so you mentioned the community again obviously bringing in this customer experience side of things what is it that you're building tell us a bit about the community that you're building with uh, the monday which is our specialty coffee community what we really want to do with that is uh, we want to learn ourselves a lot more into the coffee world and like a lot of people drink coffee but um, a lot of the time we find there's, there's not a lot of talking and, you know, just friendly uh, knowledge exchange within that. It, it can be a little bit uptight sometimes. And we really want to break through those barriers and connect your everyday coffee drinkers with, you know, even more information and more knowledge and learn together to a point where we can all be quite knowledgeable on the subject and yes. enjoy it on a deeper level than just, you know, I'll just have my usual latte or whatever. Yes, it's interesting because this is obviously very customer centric rather than like what we do with Hospitalpreneurs, which is very much about the industry. This is still about the industry, but it's on the customer side of the industry and, and educating the consumer. And so they have a platform to learn more about these things and they, maybe they didn't know that they had the capacity to do that. Maybe they haven't until you guys have created this. Obviously, you wanted to learn about coffee and so you've created this community around it so you can learn absolutely and other people want to learn too so yeah i think that that's uh, it's a really incredible community how are things going where are you guys at what's what's been happening yeah it's been going really well so many people have been coming along and if they miss out they apologize to us and you know really want to come to the next events which is really cool so i guess it's something that people want to be seen at and attend but also to learn they see that there's an opportunity to learn more, so they want to jump on that. Yeah, it's really been growing. We've had many people approach us to do different events at their venues and also lots of our community members wanting to help out. So they want to record videos, brewing different types of coffee or... Um, Write articles yeah. or 
take photos for us. Sharing their stories of where they first started Mm. going to McDonald's McCafe and ordering a cappuccino (laughs) with many different um, syrups syrups and sugar (laughs) in there. So showing their journey and bringing that a long way so that they can educate people who have been like who are there at the moment. What do these events look like? We've got three different types of events. One's called the Monday Good Mood, which is all about getting people together. There's no cost of entry. It's just everyone comes along. Um, We always have an activity there for people to do. Um, Our next one is going to be everyone gets to color in a pair of sneakers because we're having it at a sneaker and coffee shop. And so with that, um, yeah, everyone comes along, talks about coffee. There's different coffee paraphernalia there where they can have a look at it and Mm. get introduced slowly rather than diving into a big workshop which is another type of event we have so with the workshops it's about learning different brewing methods or more in depth about Mm. the type of varietal or flavors or Mm -hmm. anything further i guess which which is more about the industry professionals would be learning about i'm I'm guessing from the vibe that i'm getting yeah definitely interesting but talking about in more layman's terms yes. of how people don't really know too much and they're diving in for the first time and then our third type is uh we've also been doing tastings so rather than just doing your, your standard sort of cupping where you go along and you know discuss new types of coffee that may be out or seasonal blends that sort of stuff and just sort of you know tasting them and and chatting about what flavors are coming out these ones are more experience uh on a whole where we might do, you know, coffee and wine tastings. We might do... Together? Yeah, so together and, and talking about how they can complement each other or how we might even taste some of the very similar flavours through wine or coffee. Um, and that as well can bridge the gap between people who might be wine lovers but not understand the depth that coffee can have mm. and vice versa as well. It's interesting that you bring that up because I've been learning a lot about this recently. With um, There's another podcast that I run called Smart Fruit. Uh, which is all about the fruit industry and so how fruit can be translated into wine and into coffee mm-hmm. and the differences between coffee and wine uh, because obviously my background is mostly in, in nightlife and in booze but I'm trying to learn more about coffee so even the whole process to you know to take it from the, the paddock to the plate like they're actually quite similar actually quite similar in a lot of ways but then coffee has a few a few extra things that can take that have to take place in order to bring like grinding and, and whatnot whereas wine is effectively the same process but bottled and you leave it mm. so it's very very similar but it's incredibly interesting even these these similarities and then the differences as well so Absolutely. interesting that you bring that up and tasting them together mm. yeah yeah i think there's a lot to be learned um it's kind of like clashing worlds but as you said they kind of come from the same same source so yeah it's interesting what a different product they end up being in the end you know coffee versus wine yes what are you learning about or exploring at the moment alex i'm learning about different ways to get information out there to people so whether that be podcasting like we're doing today or through um videos um, the different channels of marketing and then different types of design and whether we can do that as an in-person experience or through posters or you know print media digital oh i am learning a lot about um back to the community side how do you actually manage that bringing a lot of people together at once can be fantastic but it can also be quite hard to manage on a logistics side and um, make sure that everyone's appreciated and has you know their certain jobs or you know certain things that they can bring to the table and feel like they're all contributing Mm -hmm. also being able to manage that and and take a step back and not be you know micromanaging it too much that's quite a challenge but yeah that's what i'm focusing on learning the moment that's the fine line isn't it because it's Mm -hmm. like when you're building a community you want it to you have a vision for it you want it to turn into something but then you have to let the community build itself and drive itself i always i've always found it's this sort of push and pull like it's almost uh, the analogy that I remember first hearing is like a steering wheel and you have to slowly let go of the steering wheel. <laughs> yep. But <laughs> you do still have to control a lot of it because you're the person driving or the people driving that growth of the community. What are the biggest struggles you've had with building that community so far? 
Well, yeah, as you mentioned, like knowing when to let go of the steering wheel. My biggest struggle is when I get in my own head <laughs> and when I, I think everything has to be a certain way. And also, I don't, I don't think I, I try and manage it too much, um, but at the same time, I think I have to. So, you know, letting it have its own legs is, is really important for me to, to learn that I can let go of the steering wheel sometimes and also knowing when to step back in. I think a good kind of balance that I've found so far is that the best time to step in is when it needs to take its next big step forward. So if you're, you're planning a new type of event or even just a new event in general for us, uh, in our particular example um, of building you know, a coffee around, a uh, community around coffee, if we want to make a statement and make a move in a new direction, that probably has to be led by Alex or myself. Whereas when it comes down to the actual events themselves and you know, once they've got a bunch of personality and a bunch of different people within that, then they can kind of lead themselves within that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what about if that community shifts over time because new people are going to come in they're going to have their own personalities and, and the community will have a different culture or develop a different culture how would you guys say that you can maintain that vision and that, that culture within the community yeah that's a really good question something I haven't even considered too much so it's really good that you're bringing it up We've had the similar thing happen in another community that we previously ran and it started to shift the dynamics of the people who were attending and there was a lot more experienced people rather than people coming in for the first time. That means the conversation had to change from our end while still keeping the vision of really strong in the education and empowering people to do what they're doing but educating them on different things. So the conversation had to change and increase in the level of intensity. See how that the culture in the community is changing. And maybe you wanted to start a community that was about a basic level of education. And if it's attracting a different type of attendee, then the actual product changes. Yeah. You know, and this is this this same concept of letting go of the wheel, but you're also controlling it. Like, do you tell the more experienced people that, hey guys, look, the level of conversation is too complex for the what we're going for, or do you let it evolve? You know, these are the sorts of things that I've been thinking about with my own communities mm-hmm. too, uh, and they're very difficult questions. I don't even know if there are answers to them. <laughs> Someone might know yeah. them. Um, some top marketers I don't know if Seth Godin or Gary V. <laughs> oh, he's always got an answer if you're yeah. listening <laughs> <laughs> let us know that would be amazing um, <laughs> cheers send me an email please <laughs> uh, I'd love to know if you're listening but yeah like what do you guys think how can you because recently I just read Netflix's Culture Dog and I listened to a podcast about the culture of Netflix and that's how they say that they maintain their culture this really strong culture within Netflix in a smaller community, do we need culture docs? And for, for question number one, and I suppose another example is that I looked at uh, Elon Musk has a, a statement uh, with Tesla where he's like, this is the objective of Tesla. I can't remember what that document was called, but it's just this statement about his vision for the business. Very, very candid. Uh, you know, he even jokes around a few times in it, but it's very, very good. And it gives you this idea as to exactly what he's building with Tesla. Should we have documents like this even in small communities? And they're seeming seem to be becoming more candid. And I wonder, with my own communities, whether I should be doing that. What do you guys think about those sorts of things? That's a really good point from the perspective of us as designers as well, where we're used to having brand guidelines for everything. Brands we're working with that have already had their branding already done and established. We were looking at this for the Monday and, you know, we've written out heaps of different things but haven't got it concrete yet. It's something we're working towards. But having a a guidelines with branding as one part of it but also the way we speak to people that's documented and the type of words we use, whether we're staying within our values and morals and ethics on everything. So... Yeah, I think those things are more yeah. important than just controlling exactly, you know, the, the culture within 
a community, I think those things will probably be driving forces, but the rest can then be a little bit, you know, up to the, the community members itself and, and where it kind of heads from there. Mm-hmm. I think just, you know, a mm-hmm. few reminders here and there of, or like consistency within the brand and how it's presented every day is going to drive that, you know, kind of, kind of just subtly and silently from the, from the back. It's incredibly challenging because we can't physically think of all the what ifs. No. And I remember thinking about that in, in we try though. Business school. <laughs> yeah, trying to come up with these yeah. contingency plans. Yeah. Or when you, uh, I think was it was one of my favorite things to do. Yeah, it was like this. Uh, I think it was in first year business law, and we're talking about contingencies, and you can't write every contingency in a, in some sort of contract because you won't be able to think of everything. You know, otherwise the the document would be. You can just keep thinking huge, of things you know? forever. So yeah, you just keep going. There'd be a lot of airtight contracts though. And no way to get out of it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 But then it would take them months to yeah. get Nothing this, would this, get this done. Check over the document, right? So there would be no contracts at all? So in the end? All, yeah, all <laughs> contracts would be incredibly expensive and solicitors would be even better paid. Yeah. <laughs> Written I don't in a contract know, is no contracts. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, cause it, but then it clogs up the system mm. and then, yeah, anyway. Businesses wouldn't get anything done if yeah. that was paid. If they were so scared about these things. My point is about contingencies. And coming up with these ideas around if a community culture is building in a way that we don't want it to build in, what do we do? What would you do if the community wasn't growing in the way that you wanted it to? So I think that um, if a community wasn't growing in the way that we wanted it to, it would only be because we weren't paying close attention to uh, where we actually wanted it to go and having that clear vision within ourselves uh, as the, the people who created it and are driving that. So I think, you know, we'll always retain a certain level of responsibility and drive behind the community, whether it has its own legs or not. I think it's more likely to die out and not go, you know, crazy in a way that we don't want it to, rather than, it, you know, going nuts and, and being kind of out of control in a direction that we that we didn't envision. You know, I'm not too worried about it getting out of control from something that we, we can't steer back on track, at least. Okay, so you think it's more likely to fizzle than to detour yeah i think uh, that i think that'd be the case um and the only reason it would deviate, so. yeah the only reason it would go somewhere that we didn't want it to was if we had lost passion or, or lost um the drive to keep that going so that's kind of a different problem i think then in that journey we're getting all this feedback you know we should be not just sometimes we should always be getting in my perspective is we should always be getting feedback but then in steering this ship how much of that feedback do we listen to? That's a really good way of thinking about it is like, what feedback should we be listening to? I have a little test that I do for myself and my own personal values is I check what I'm doing against, you know, the values, the strong values that I have. So I have five guiding values in my life. And if anything is conflicting with that, then I'm like, okay, that's not right. If the project that I'm working on fulfills a few of those values, but doesn't really fulfill the other values, but it doesn't conflict with them, then I'm like, okay, I'm still going in, you know, the right trajectory here. But the same as like the community, if it's going in a different direction and deviating, then we'll look back at our values and see, okay, well, it's it's now conflicting with a few of our main values. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need a change that back to what we originally had said that we wanted it to be or alter our values so that we can you know travel with it and go on this different detour i have a few questions about that now um so firstly what are your five values so my five values are being curious staying enthusiastic being analytical trying to be empowering for people and always being relentless at what I do. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Are they different for the Monday? Or are they the same values? They're quite similar, I'd say. A little bit more from Tyler's perspective. Um, We haven't actually nailed down our five values for the Monday, but taking in some of his perspective, it may be a little bit different. Um, I think consideration is probably like one of our main ones because we like to be considerate of people's experiences and consider the industry as well as the consumer so do you think that all businesses need these five values then because that's an interesting point like i've not 
not heard this perspective on business culture. So do you think that all businesses should have five values that they live by? I think they should have values. I don't think there's got to be a specific number of them. Five is just a number that sits well with me and I couldn't distill it down anymore from five. So five was what I was left with. That's really interesting because for me, I've got three and my three are curiosity, ambition and humility. Mm. And so they're my three uh, that I look for in, in other people and in life and in business. Very good. Yeah. Um, do, you have, do you have values that you live by, Tyler? I do, but again, I don't have them on top of mind right now. But I think listening and being uh, considerate are two of my main ones that I bring into the Monday, especially yes. since it is something that both myself and the community that I'm, you know, that we're trying to foster, um, it is a lot about that learning aspect and um, you know being very open minded and taking on new information while also being considerate to what's uh, there already. Like we're definitely not trying, like if we're making our own little, you know, gap in the coffee world. We're definitely not trying to dominate anyone else or, you know, push anyone else out. We're simply trying to encourage and, and grow that uh, within the, the community. So those are the two I'd say that uh, come to mind when talking about the Monday and my values aligning. I want to try to relate it a little bit more in case listeners haven't connected the two, how relevant building a community is with what you're doing and then hospitality as well. So the way I think about it is even when you're building a culture around your brand, maybe listeners at home own a a cocktail bar or a cafe and they're not realizing that building that community is super, super important around the brand that you're building. So can you tell us a bit about how relevant everything we've been talking about is for listeners? Yeah, definitely. When um, we first got started with the Monday We actually had people messaging us asking what our opening hours were. So they thought we were a cafe in the first few months. And that was really interesting because we didn't realize that we'd been putting out a persona that was of a cafe. From that, it goes to show that building a consistent brand that talks about similar things all the time makes it seem like it's really strong and solid. Mm. And that would be the same for... You know, if you do have a cafe or bar and showing the same things all the time, people are going to want to be involved in it. Mm -hmm. So relating back to listeners at home, maybe they own a business or run a business. How can they brand themselves well? The biggest thing that anyone can pay attention to and start doing it right now, whether you've got, you know, a very strong or what you would consider to be a very strong brand or, you know, very well-known business, it's simply consistency. Uh, It's showing up every day and putting out, you know, a consistent message to the world. And that goes, you know, down to your branding. It goes to the way you interact with your customers, the way you present yourself online, the way that your staff or yourself presents in terms of the business. Yeah, it all comes back to consistency. And after a, a while, people do start to take notice of that and they will understand more and more about not only your business or your product or, you know, your bar or your cafe, but also your values and uh, where, you're, where you stand within that will shine through. What about this, uh, this overused term of authenticity? What does that actually mean to you? And, and how does that come into play when, when you're being consistent with this message? Well, I think that consistency, it builds authenticity because uh, nothing breaks illusion of authenticity um, like being inconsistent. Because if someone, like by being consistent with something, you're basically setting someone's expectations Mm. at a certain level or for a certain experience and once that's broken your authenticity kind of goes out the window because Mm -hmm. people start to question what they've been seeing or been hearing or been Mm. you know experiencing uh so by being consistent and also understanding where you're coming from in the start uh then that will build authenticity within a a community Mm. within a, a following within you know your regular customers uh all of that I like that you've got to add up. Yeah, I think on the other end of the authenticity, it's if you start something and you've got your brand values in mind, what we were talking about earlier, the brand you build, if you do that, then share that message consistently, it's going to be authentic because it's from what you really believe in. But if you start to be like, okay, I want to be a really high-end brand, but I actually just enjoy 
downing some tinnies on the weekends with my buddies, but I'm going to put out this completely different high end sort of brand that's over time, unless you're really good at lying to people, it's not going to be easy to keep up. And then once you slip back into some of your normal everyday habits that are authentic to you, then it's going to give mixed messages to your audience and to your customers. So keeping on brand from the start, working out what you actually do value and what morals and ethics you do have and want to include in your business, just try and make them reflect you as a person. Mm, That's an interesting point because, and when you brought that up, Tyler, there before, it made a lot more sense to me when you said consistency, I was thinking doing the same thing over and over again. But consistency, the way I think about that, when you describe it, is more about congruency. So it's about everything that you send out being the same. So it's a consistent message to use consistent. Now I understand what you meant. Absolutely, yeah. So that's a really interesting point because Seth Godin wrote in uh, All Marketers Are Liars, which he changed the title to All Marketers Tell Stories. Uh, First one was way better. Yeah, switch. I agree. But uh, in All Marketers Are Liars slash All Marketers Tell Stories... He talked about exactly the same thing where if there's anything that is out of line with who you are, then it's inauthentic or it's, it's inconsistent as you would describe it uh, or it's incongruent as maybe I would describe it. Mm-hmm. So that's a really interesting point to bring that out from a different perspective and try to bring in even three different perspectives to voice that message. So consistency or congruency or authenticity love it so that's actually what authenticity really means i think yeah essentially yeah what innovations or innovative techniques have you seen in your time in the industry uh with the rise of stuff like snapchat instagram stories that sort of stuff we're getting a a lot closer look into people's lives or the behind the scenes never before have we been able to live you know vicariously through either someone personally or through a brand like you know in 2017 2018 like our modern day age having said that and back to the authenticity side as well it's never been really more important to be authentic because people can see everything Mm. it's so transparent Mm. Uh, so a big shift in what I've seen in the in the hospitality industry is that transparency and uh, authenticity uh, really becoming uh, absolutely like you know vital yeah vital yeah yeah, part of doing business and growing a good business and uh, connecting with your audience to grow even and bigger and stronger Alex do you have a perspective on that different angle on marketing what you were talking about earlier before our interview started about live streaming different education for people in the industry or people who aren't in the industry, whether it's, you know, you're live streaming from your cafe because you've, um, the chef has cooked up some really awesome dishes that they want to show you live streaming, those type of things and getting an insight into the world of others and, you know, broadening education for everyone has definitely been an innovative thing for me, which I like to see and want to see more of. And why would you live stream over post a video? Because it's right then in the moment. And if you are on the viewing end of that, you will be able to feel what the atmosphere is when they're there, as well as you feel like you're part of it. You get to contribute and see it happening in real time, which is really important. And it's something that you don't get from just having a recorded video because it also gives people time to edit it and put those touches on it which mm. don't make it feel like you're there in person mm. maybe inauthentic that's it Actually. Maybe that people <laughs> question things I, I like that the live idea is that it's very real that you can't hide anything it Stuff is literally might go wrong you don't know yeah it's it's that when you see a brand emitting or transmitting this message through a live video you know that they can't hide anything that it is them there doing their thing and maybe with videos, other videos, they're edited and, and such, like you just described. But what about even with stories? And like we've seen Facebook Messenger story, obviously Instagram and Facebook are you know, one and the same in terms mm-hmm. of ownership. Uh, and you can feed it all through. But then 
the role that Snapchat plays and whether Snapchat has been declining. I know the use of Snapchat's been declining since stories have come into play and what role do stories really play uh, in your perspective? I think taking it one step further, you know, from the Instagram stories itself, that the, the kind of message that they deliver um, is, is the customer journey. So if we do want to take that back to, you know, your, your standard you know, edited video format, I think it's never been a more important time to delve further into, um, you know, a product or an audience or anything like that and look at the actual journeys of the, the customers or the clients or the, the people who interact with a brand or a business, you know, a cafe, a bar, anything. That's what a, is really grabbing people at the moment because they can see themselves in that then. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, to take that to Instagram stories and stuff like that on a, you know, everyday smaller scale, that's a great way to get those customer journeys or even the journey of the cafe across, you know, in little snippets that people can follow along with. With Instagram stories over, I guess, Snapchat, it really keeps people and brands top of mind. Whereas on Snapchat, there wasn't, it was more like personal face-to-face or with marketers or people who were a single influencer rather than a big business or brand. And for your local bars or cafes or breweries, it's really good to be able to stay top of mind with your customers by having Instagram stories and, you know, showing the customers like Tyler was saying and and making it relatable for the people viewing, Mm. you know, make it a more inviting environment for them to walk into Mm. in their life. It kind of qualifies the type of people that will um, gravitate towards your brand before they might even experience it, Mm -hmm. like in real life. This is the magic of the internet. That's it. Is that we can reach people who we've never been able to reach before. Yeah, you can kind of catch a glimpse of what to expect. And I, uh, I think for, from the business side as well, the more barriers that you can break down of, you know, barriers of entry that you can break down for someone to interact or actually put themselves, you know, align themselves mm-hmm. with your business, um, then the better chance you have of creating a, a loyal fan base and expanding that. That I think that was put incredibly well, like breaking down barriers for brands to reach customers. And if doing a live stream video means that you inject yourself into their social media world, you've you've penetrated their little universe, which is great. I think I think every brand should be getting amongst this, and they will. It's just a matter of time. That's it. And then that will be flooded, and there'll be a new thing. I think too, uh, it's important to keep in mind that it's not actually about the the medium that you're putting the message across as well. Mm -hmm. We should use all of the tools that we have at our disposable at the moment. So like we've just been discussing live streaming, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, you know, even podcasting as well. Very great tools that we can use right now to get uh, our message across uh, to our consumers and connect with our audience. But they're just tools. Like, at the end of the day, the message should be the same across all of those and, you know, same for future as well. That's the important part that we need to keep in mind to connect with people, not just the medium that we're doing that on now. What changes do you want to see take place in the industry? Everyone just needs to be open-minded and just learn from each other. Don't be so secretive about what you got going on. Just throw your stuff out there everyone be mates and build a better future together as generic as that sounds but get your stuff out there have fun along the way and connect with people whether it is your competitor or like you know your competitor what you feel is your competitor or you know other brands that are doing similar stuff to you um or may have similar audiences like at the end of the day we we would like myself i I started um, a business or a community to make the industry that I'm going into better. So if you want to make an industry better, then just do anything you can to do that. How can you overcome the fear around putting out all this content? Uh, Because a lot of business owners or or managers or people in control of these marketing departments are scared that other people are going to take their ideas or, you know, that somehow they're losing something by being transparent. I think that is a very, you know, it's a valid fear. Like we're always, we're all um, inherently scared of 
what other people's people will think of us and you know if anyone's doing better than us out there or that we'll get judged for doing what we're doing or that people will steal our ideas but the best thing about putting your ideas out there is that you quickly come to understand that it doesn't actually do bad things for your brand it pushes you further and pushes you further as an authority in that field because if people are seeing that you're doing stuff that helps the industry or um, you know you're open to learning new things in the industry then they will be more susceptible to be learning new things and looking to you to learn new things Alex, you've been quiet for a while. I want to ask, what's your creative process or the steps that you take to make your ideas a reality? My creative process goes from what is the end objective that I want and reverse engineering it and working on little steps at a time. So if I want um, our community to have 12 events this year, I'm going to start by doing one and maybe planning the next few but not just diving in and planning all 12 at once because that will be overwhelming for me. And for the community as well. Yeah, and for other people involved, but also it will stifle my way of, you know, quickly failing and then working out how I can do better. Mm -hmm. If I've already planned them all out, that doesn't give me much leeway to move things around and improve my process. One of the main things that I do is definitely chunk everything down into little steps and you know work on a little bit of a time i think it's interesting that your point there is about staying agile being able to fail quickly uh is is what i take away from that is like having little failures and then you can adjust or adapt and if you plan the whole thing then it's kind of you know that's how big business operates and then Mm. they can't move very quickly because it's sort of set yeah you know and then it costs a lot to get that message out to change any of that Mm. as well so interesting uh we talked about failure in an episode with nick pin we talked about it with dan norris uh and also tom griffith mentioned it in his episode so it's kind of this it's this interesting point that keeps coming up about failing failing quickly being agile i think we mentioned eric rees a lean startup in a previous episode too why is being agile important so that I can explore curiosity faster and be able to learn from things quite quickly and change it with the community and the other people involved because it's not just me. There is other people and people are ever changing. Mm-hmm. We don't live in an age anymore where we can just have a set and forget business model. It just doesn't happen. There's so many new things happening around us the digital stuff as well as even brick and mortar is changing a lot we can't just have a you know a standard business anymore like just be you know a plumber a cafe a you know bar Mm. like these things don't exist they're kind of becoming more and more niche and if we want to be able to create our niche but also find our niche then we need to be agile to be able to explore that further and further until we find the spot that we want to sit Mm. What is it about that that niche that, that's a concept that you're bringing up? Yeah, I think it is, um, like, it's a level of connectedness that we do all have, you know, in the digital age that lets us know exactly what businesses, what good for what, you know, what are their ratings, where are they located, uh, what are their opening hours. Like, we know so much more just immediately about every single business. We can be a lot more selective as consumers. So, uh, yeah, we may as well use the tools that we have to be selective so on the other end from the business side you need to be a niche that sits where you want on that note i just read a book called the paradox of choice by barry schwartz and great book and to bring it back to the consumer side the customer side the side that you guys are focused on this idea of this overwhelming amount of choice and all this information we have available one of the points that Barry Schwartz makes in this book is that with all this choice, even when you've got better choices, you're actually less happy about the choice that you make. Is all this information that's being available, that is available to us, actually good for us? Paralysis by choice. When you're, you know, trying to figure out what you want to do, and as consumers, we have ample choices to make to figure out what we want to do for dinner. 
versus where we want to go and work out or where we want to eat. There's so many different choices out there. And so it does make it harder. I think businesses need to cut through that, have like a really select message of what they do and that will help consumers be able to make the choice faster based on how much they relate to the end objective of that business. So having a clear, because my question there is, my next question is about how knowing that customers or consumers or clients, we people think like this, how can businesses use that in order to generate or attract that business in this overwhelming plethora of options that people have the answer that you brought up there was about having a clear very clear relatable message what does that sort of message look like and how can a business develop that message so for example i'll use lawyers if you're looking for a lawyer it's probably going to be for a specific thing so if you're looking at all the different law firms and they all just say we help businesses and then it's just like okay but I need to know this specific thing you've got to go through all those different ones but if a business lawyer said I work in um, partnership agreements and that is what I'm really good at if you see that and you're like I want a partnership agreement great cool well I'm going to go to that lawyer because that's what they specialize in being really specific will help other people know what you're really good at what you like doing and they will choose you over someone who just does a broad brush on their industry. I've got two questions on that. So the first one is around obviously building the community and generating business. That's that's really, because building a community is almost the same thing as building business because you're building a community and culture around your brand and attracting people to what you do. With commencing that vision from what, I gathered from your answer there, you're saying to start with something that is very niche and then over time, this is what I've learned from this, is that we have to broaden it. So we have to start with something super niche to attract our first people who resonate with that message and then we can get broader and broader. So when we develop a business, to start with something very small, like maybe you just do partnership agreements if you're a law firm or or a bar or a, or a cafe or a bar. Maybe if you're a cafe, you do the best doppios in that suburb. Who knows? Right? Maybe that's something that you can brand yourself as. But then to broaden it later, people people go there for that, but then later more people will be attracted to it because they know you're a good cafe because you've grown in size. Is that something that brands need to do? Or And after that, has this concept of having a niche become more and more relevant? Is it something that brands need to do more and more? Do they need to to chunk down further into a niche to commence their business? I don't think it's 100% a necessity, but I think it will make it easier. It's it's sort of a unique selling point that you can have straight off the the bat. With that, having that unique selling point, it will make it easier for you as a business to run. You'll have a very strong core vision. If you have employees, they'll know what they're working towards and your consumers will know exactly how to recommend you to other consumers that are out there wanting to use a service or go to a venue like yours. Obviously, you guys are learning a lot about coffee now. What's your number one industry resource? So my number one industry resource is actually looking outside of the industry you're in and taking keys from other industries because then other people in your industry aren't focused on that thing. And I think looking outside of the box you'll get a lot more perspective and you'll see what other people have done in a different, total different industry. So you're not ever copying or, you know, using that exact idea or concept, but you're adapting it for what you do. And you're also using a niche. You're developing a niche for you in that industry. That's something that I try to do with the Hospital Preneurs podcast is I'm bringing in all these business concepts into the hospitality world and these marketing ideas that I've not, seen used in hospitality yeah so that totally resonates with me your answer there what do you think about that time yeah i really agree with that actually um, as soon as alex said it i was like yes absolutely it's really cool having experience in multiple industries and now you know working and looking within the coffee industry or the hospitality industry with a 
bit of a broader scope. We've found it a lot in, say, the music industry where there's a lot of opportunities that, um, you know, we see from our design and marketing background that we can easily implement into our local music scene that people just don't utilize or think of because they're so, it's an industry of that's the way it's always been done, Mm -hmm. which just like (laughs) kills everything (laughs) eventually. But slowly, you know, bringing over some concepts we've, we've learned from other sides of things, you know, whether that's collaborations or simple marketing techniques or even just treating your band like a business rather than a, a, you know, a side project, music, garage thing. Things like that can just really change your perspective on stuff and, um, yeah, looking at it differently. Have you guys had mentors on your journey or people that you've learned from as you've been developing? I definitely have. Uh, one of my main mentors is Baz Gardner from The Social Advisor and he really helped me nail down like what my values are and how to consistently put them out into the world. Um, another one would be Seth Godin, his uh, a mentor from afar. I Def- call them digital mentors. Digital mentors, yeah. yes. That, that's um, He's one of mine. Um, and Paul Jarvis and Jason Zook, who run the podcast Invisible Office Hours. They're both freelancers and have many different businesses together and apart. And with that, you know, they work on things for them and themselves, but also to help people. And that's like one of their main Mm -hmm. focuses. So they're my mentors. Uh, Yeah, I've had a few as well. Um, What comes to mind is uh, my my boss at my day job at the marketing agency. Um, What's the marketing agency? So I work at Oz Garage. I'm the art director there. Um, And my boss, James, he's quite determined and can like persistent with his vision which as you know someone who's can be a little bit more turbulent in my uh you know day-to-day feelings on everything that i'm working towards um that's been a really good you know strong mentor to look towards we've been through a lot together in the last four or so years that i've been working there um you know a lot of different stuff's happened with the business and we've taken different directions and we've changed the way that we look at things just like almost every week, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, while trying to keep a consistent business model there as well. And seeing that, you know, we can just keep chipping away at it and we're, you know, heading towards something that we want to see it become, you know, seeing him drive that as a really strong driving force. That's, you know, really, really influenced me and encouraged me every day to keep on going with the stuff that I have going on as well. And then digital mentor side, um, let's probably say Pat Flynn. So I got into his podcast probably like four, five years ago or so, and, um, well, maybe, maybe three years ago. Which was the Smart Passive Income podcast. Yeah, Smart Passive Income podcast. Um, and I just love how he's very modest and honest and, you know, does really good business with people at the heart of what he's doing, um, but isn't afraid to just really dream big and kind of, you know, chat to other people who do the same and it just opened up my mind to a whole lot of possi- possibilities that are out there and made me dream a lot bigger as well as talking to Alex as well and learning from her. Incredible. Thank you for sharing uh, those, those people with us. I'll link whoever it is as well in the show notes too. What's your biggest challenge right now? My biggest challenge is managing the many projects that I'm working on and figuring out what is priority based on my values and like other people's expectations Mm -hmm. my biggest challenge um yeah it kind of stems from that as well both looking at what i can do at the moment and what i can't do and not trying to do it all because i've got a lot of things that i would love to see you know come to fruition at some stage but i just can't do it all at once um you know working a full-time job as well as trying to do a bunch of stuff on the side you know, I'm only human and I can't expect that much of myself, but finding the balance there between what I can do at the moment and what I can save for later and kind of learn yeah. along the way to really make the most of that when it's time. It uh, plagues the creative mind, I think. It's a hard one. Chase shiny things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everything's so shiny. <laughs> Everything, yeah. Um, ultimately, where do you want to be? Where's the Monday? What's, what's it going to look like? The Monday will be a community of friendly people 
that will connect Australia's specialty coffee scene. I very much like that vision. So, together, what is the next step? The next step is for us to meet all the people in Australia's specialty coffee scene and start to connect the dots for our community. Well, thank you very much for being on the show today, guys. It's been awesome having you on and I'm looking forward to chatting again soon. You're Thank very you. welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, James. Stay in touch with the show after hours at Hospopreneurs on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Creativity and innovation in hospitality. The Hospopreneurs podcast with James Henderson. Sound like tomorrow. Sweet as sound. What does tomorrow sound like? Let's show you.